talk about this essay by now, Ferguson. As I said, now Ferguson is has been considered a rising star in on the on the conservative circles. Uh, uh, he uh, has degrees, uh, two degrees, I think, from Oxford. He has taught at Oxford and Cambridge. He's one of the most um, uh, erudite. Uh, people out there, uh, he is, uh, you know, has an extensive knowledge of history. He's an historian. Uh, he is. He's got a British accent, which just raises anybody's IQ by at least twenty points. It's not just any British accent. It's it's one of those like, you know, where, where it's a sophisticated British accent. Thank you, John. Another fifty dollars. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, we're, 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 thank you. We're chipping away at the at the goal. There's still a way to go, but we are chipping away, which is essential. So thank you. Uh, let's see. So um, uh, now Ferguson has written this essay about uh, Cold War II. He has been arguing that we have been in a Cold War with China for a long time. He's probably the first person, first public intellectual to really declare that we are in a uh, second Cold War and, and uh, equate the Cold War uh, that we're in with China with the Cold War that we had uh, with the Soviet Union. Um, I, you know, we can, we'll talk about a Cold War 2.0 at a different occasion. I, I think this is way overstated. And, and I think part of the problem is that I don't think now Ferguson understands China. Uh, I'll just give you one example. Uh, for example, he is... Uh, he writes in this essay that was published uh, this week in uh, the Free Press. He says, China is clearly not only an ideological rival, rival firmly committed to Marxist, Leninist, and one-party rule. It's just not true. It's just not true. China is not committed to Marxist, Leninist. China, China is not a Marxist country. China is an authoritarian state committed to Chinese ideals. Uh, China is much more of a nationalist, uh, authoritarian, uh, imperialistic state from the Chinese empire than it is a Marxist-Leninist state. I mean, it's doubtful that Mao Zedong himself read very much Marx and Lenin, never mind uh, Xi and Deng and all these others who are basically engaged in, you know, uh, uh, make America, I mean, Chinese agenda is very simple. This is why I think Donald Trump relates so much to Xi. Xi's agenda is very simple, make China great again. And Xi is now referring to uh, Mao's period, because uh, during Mao's period, Xi knows very well uh, that China was very poor and, uh, and very weak. She is referring to uh, China's, you know, uh, uh, history as an empire. She is referring to China two, three hundred years ago. And she's whole focus, as was Deng's, as is most of the modern Chinese leadership, its whole focus is on Chinese greatness. And its whole orientation is towards Chinese philosophy and Chinese history. Scott McDonald who I had on the show a while ago is an expert on, 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 on China served in the military. Um, as, as part of his service in the military, he was um, uh, kind of anal analyzed, was responsible for analyzing China, uh, knows Taiwan inside out, uh, knows China inside out in terms of the, and, and it's, it's clear that what really drives them, yes, they use the facade particularly for their people, because they are the Chinese Communist Party, after all. So they have to justify what they do in Leninist, Marxist terms. But they don't care. They don't care. Right. Now, so, uh, so, uh, so what, what uh, now Ferguson is saying, okay, so they're committed, not only are they firmly an ideological rival, they are, but not the kind of ideology that Niall thinks, they're also a technological competitor, the only one the U.S. confronts and feels such an artificial intelligence and quantum computing. And that is true. Certainly the Russians uh, are, are nowhere, uh, 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 nowhere close to the Chinese in any of these fields. And he says it's also a military rival, I would argue, the only military rival we have, with a navy that is already larger than ours and a nuclear arsenal that is uh, catching up fast. And it is a geopolitical rival asserting itself not only in the Indo-Pacific 
but also through proxies in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, i.e. through Russia uh, in Eastern Europe. So China is the enemy. China is the party that we engage in within a Cold War. But here's the thing. As now Ferguson looks at America, he says the real difference is that it might be the case that it is the United States that is playing the part of the Soviet Union and China, in a sense, is playing the part of the United States. Now, this is such an outrageous statement that he better have the goods to back it up. I mean, let's remember who the Soviet Union was. The Soviet Union was indeed a, uh, a, a empire dedicated to uh, national to socialism, dedicated to communism. The Soviet Union was completely and utterly bankrupt. It was dirt poor, in spite of what the CIA told us in the 1970s. The Soviet Union uh, had, a, you know, was uh, active in uh, slaughtering, murdering its political opponents within, uh, and even in the post-Stalin era, uh, dissidents were often sent to Siberia, and many, many of them died. If you have ever read Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn's descriptions of the gulags and what was going on in the gulags uh, was not under Stalin. This was post-Stalin. So the Soviet Union represented the worst type of authoritarianism possible. No property rights, no free speech, no rights at all. A complete and utter authoritarian system. Uh, and it was, you know, complete disaster. Now, what does Niall Ferguson focus on? So a comparison between the Soviet Union of the 60s and 70s and maybe 80s and the United States of today, man, that is a reach. So what does now Ferguson, what does Ferguson actually focus on? He says Soviet system squandered resources and all but guaranteed shortages of consumer goods. The Soviet healthcare system was crippled by dilapidated hospitals and chronic shortages of equipment. There was grinding poverty, hunger, and child labor. Now, notice, he doesn't mention freedom. He doesn't mention one-party rule. He doesn't mention the gulags. He doesn't mention free speech. He mentions some economic facts. Now, to what extent do those economic facts map onto America? Well, Ferguson claims that in America today, quote, such conditions exist only in the bottom quintile of the economic distribution, though the extent to which they do exist is truly appalling. Does anybody, even in the bottom quintile of America in poverty, really have a shortage in consumer goods? Are consumer goods not there? Now, maybe they can't afford a lot of them, but can they afford bread? Yes. Were there bread shortages in the Soviet Union? Yes. Can you compare the shortages in America, even for the bottom quintile, to the shortages of the Soviet system? No. No. The Soviet healthcare system was crippled and dilapidated. Uh, bottom quintile get Medicaid. Not great, but it's insurance. Do they really have the same dilapidated healthcare system? No innovation, no drugs, no technology, nothing. No cancer treatment, nothing available to them because they're poor in America. Is that really a fair comparison? No. Is there a shortage of equipment in American hospitals? No. I mean, it could be better, but not as compared to the Soviet Union. And yes, poor people in America can't afford it, but they get Medicaid. The United States redistributes on a massive scale. Indeed, according to work I've seen, redistribution of wealth, welfare, in all its different capacities, from Medicaid to food stamps to welfare checks to everything else, unemployment insurance and everything, added together, gives uh, most poor people who can figure out how to work the welfare state uh, an income that is almost the same as a lower middle class income. Indeed, one of the horrors of American society is the fact that if you're lower middle class and working, you often 
achieve the same standard of living of somebody on welfare. We talked about this when that song came out. Do you remember that song? What was that song, that, that uh, the country song that all the right freaked out about and was, was super supportive until they discovered the guy wasn't really one of theirs and then they kind of turned against him. But for a while, he was like the biggest hit in the world. And, and this idea of the frustration of the low middle class about the fact that welfare recipients have an income equivalent to theirs. So is it really that bad in the bottom quintile? Now, it is true that informal mortality in the late Soviet Union was around 25,000. And in the United States, for a single mother in the Mississippi Delta, you really look, you're really searching, you're really, you're really, you know, analyzing the data. Uh, so for a single mother in the Mississippi Delta or in, the, in Appalachia, it's 13,000. So 13,000 is half of what it was in the Soviet Union. That is in the lowest of the lowest in particular places. Maybe one reason we should have legalized abortion in Appalachia and the Mississippi Delta so that uh, we don't get so much of the tragedy and the heartache and the uh, uh, you know, horror of infant mortality. But also, it is interesting that single motherhood is in decline, particularly teenage pregnancies are massively in decline in the United States over the last 20 years. God forbid a conservative actually give us those statistics and remind us that uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the number of single mothers, particularly in their teens, in the Mississippi Delta, in their Palachian, is declining dramatically, and things are getting better, better? No, you're not allowed to say that. Better for those people uh, over the last, uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, so you're taking a subcategory, a subcategory, and then emphasizing it as if that's growing, or as if it's significant, as if it's meaningful, and it's still half of the entire Soviet Union. I'm not sure what the point is exactly. But let's look closer now, Ferguson says, that, that, that that's not enough, right? Problem with the Soviet Union, he says, is they had a constant deficit, constant deficit. They spent money they didn't have. Well, isn't that the case of the United States? They have a constant deficit. U.S. deficit forecast by the Congressional Budget Office is going to exceed 5% of GDP and rise to 8.5% of GDP by 2054. And of course, the central government now is involved in decision making. Look at look at the Chip Act and the and I wonder. I, I'm pretty sure now Ferguson is not against the Chip Act, so he's not against centralized decision making for investment in the name of industrial policy if it supports his thesis around Cold War II. But yes, the Biden administration is involved in industrial policy, again, to compare this to Soviet Union? Really? The reality is that the United States can fix its budget deficit quite easily. Just a few, just some liberalizing of the U.S. economy, just some deregulation, energizing kind of the, 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 the spirit of entrepreneurship in this country. And that, def that government deficit w will shrink dramatically. There's still a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, flexibility, and, and in this economy, there's still a lot of innovation. There's still a lot of... Let's ignore all that. Let's be really dark. Let's be really pessimistic. Let's really only focus on the fact that we have a deficit and the Soviet Union have a deficit and ignore everything else. The deficit in the Soviet Union involved a complete structural collapse you know, to solve the Soviet Union's economic problems. That's actually not necessary yet in the United States. I wish now Ferguson and the rest of the conservatives and people on the right were advocating for the kind of economic policies that would lead to a robust, thriving, growing economy. But no, they'd rather muse about how horrific America is, how almost like the Soviet Union it is. It is a disaster according to now focusing. Now, it's not good, but the Soviet Union? Now, what about our military? We have, we're told, the mightiest, strongest, best military in the world in human history. I've said that on this show. Now disagrees. We have a military that's simultaneously expensive and unequal to the task it confronts. Um, right? We can't win a war in Afghanistan. Well, that reminds me, USSR didn't win a war in Afghanistan. Now, 
Now it says it's because, you know, it's because our, our military force is only strong on paper. The fact is that in reality, we cannot win. We cannot fight. We don't have the right equipment. We don't have the right tools. We don't have the right people. We just cannot fight. We lack modern equipment. We don't train people enough. We have a lack of maintenance funding. And our adversaries all know this. Now, there is a lot of truth to that. However, <laughs> the real problem with the American military is not lack of equipment, lack of training, or lack of maintenance. The real problem with the American military is not the fact that we do not have modern equipment. Indeed, our equipment is generations ahead of our rivals, including the Chinese. Our problem is we don't know how to win because we don't know how to deploy those resources and we never deploy them to win. We have not deployed the resources to win. It's not a lack of technology. It's not a lack of equipment. It's not a lack of any of these things. It's a lack of will. It's a lack of morality. It's a lack of ethics. It's a lack of morality of war. How to win a war. Read my Just War Theory versus America essay. We don't not spend enough on military. We probably spend too much on military. We don't spend it effectively because we can't use it. We have a bad philosophy that guides our use. The problem is not money. The problem is not weapons. The problem is philosophical. And the reality is, and we're seeing that on the battlefield of Ukraine, that Russia, with a much bigger army, with much more ammunition, with greater numbers and, and, and of troops and equipment and everything cannot beat a scrappy, small, untrained, lacking in equipment Ukrainian military. I mean, they make advances, but they're not beating them. They're not losing either. They're fighting them to a draw. And that's Ukraine. That's pretty pathetic. In an all-out war where they are not, they are not constrained by rules of engagement. They are not constrained by what's taught in West Point, just war theory. Russians <laughs> certainly are not constrained by any ideas about morality in war. And yet they can't win. So our enemies do not have better militaries, more advanced militaries, more anything. What we don't have is the will. That's a problem. But that doesn't equate us to the Soviet Union. It might it maybe equates us to Rome towards its decline or equate us to, I don't know, maybe it doesn't equate us to anybody. Maybe it's a new phenomena of a rotten philosophy eating away at a great civilization. Actually, that's Rome. And the rotten philo philosophy is, this, is similar. It's a derivative of Christianity. And this is a conservative. who is missing the trees and missing the forest. He says, the Soviet Union had senile old leaders, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernoko. So do we. Oh, that's a fundamental. There you go. That makes us the Soviet Union. And then in the Soviet Union, they were very cynical about all their institutions. So are we. I mean, think about that. God, Soviet Union institutions were authoritarian, not authoritarian, totalitarian. Yes, we're cynical. You don't think there's a difference in kind between our cynicism and theirs? Now, it is true. America is a country in decline. It is true that we risk being that we risk being beaten by the communists. And I'm, I'm going to stop. You can, you can find this essay if you want to read the rest of it. You can find this essay on Free Press. It's just, it's just too ridiculous. It is true that we risk losing to the Chinese. But it is not because of the stats that we get from now focusing. And it is not because of the fact of a weak military or weak economy. I mean, he goes on to say, 
Look at the fentanyl epidemic. It's the equivalent of the alcohol epidemic in the Soviet Union where everybody dies from alcohol poisoning. Um, you know, and then, and then he goes into, you know, the left in America. Of course, it had to go, had to go there. It, you know, it was equivalent to the, to the, crazy, the craziness uh, of the Soviet Union. And he just draws these artificial, ridiculous parallels. You can talk about American decline without comparing us to the Soviet Union. You can talk about American decline and try to pinpoint its origins. And if your conclusion is Americans are declined because of statism, Americans are declined because we're moving away from the principles of capitalism and individual rights, I'm all with you. But there's no conclusion like that. There's no summing up. There's just, we look like the Soviet Union because we're cynical like the Soviet Union was. And as a consequence, we're probably going to lose Cold War II. Now, it's interesting. Because why didn't he run the same stats on China? China has massive deficits. Those are increasing because China's in real economic problems right now. The uh, uh, Xi just fired a huge number of generals because there's massive corruption in the Chinese military, and a lot of those super-duper weapons that they built, maybe they're not as good as they claim because maybe, maybe a lot of these generals siphoned off the money and put it in their own pockets. So, um, and you could go on. Do you think the Chinese are not cynical about their institutions? The Chinese have a phenomenon called lying down, which where young people refuse to work. They lie down. They don't go to work. They refuse to work. They live off their parents, or they find other ways, but they don't work. There's a massive amount of cynicism. The idea that, uh, you know, uh, America is beyond redemption, that China is the future, I mean, it's possible. But then you'd have to really identify the cause, and the cause is philosophical. And the cause is partially Niles' faults. The cause is that the conservatives cannot mount any kind of significant opposition that is non-statist to the left. The cause is growing statism on both left and right. The cause is the rejection of reason. Ayn Hirsi Ali is part of that, right? by the right, embrace of religion on the right, in response to the negation of reason by the left. So the left becomes more status, the right matches them. The left becomes more unreasonable, that is, rejects reason, the right matches them. The left is crazy altruism, the right matches them. That is why we're in trouble. That is why we might lose the Cold War. Not because, not because of similarities to the Soviet Union that are all superficial, instead of looking at ideas. Now, it is true that as we become more statist, we rely more on government, we become more collectivist, we become more altruistic. In that sense, we become more like the Soviet Union. But then deal with the ideas. Don't kind of convolute the stats and come up with bogus kind of parallels. It, it was a very, very, very disappointing article from Niall Ferguson, who I think is smarter than that. Uh, but it, it, it reflects kind of the, I don't know, it, it, there's some sense in which the right has become mindless. The right can't really see the drivers can't really see the principles and it's become unbelievably dark darker than I am about America they really are, are detached from reality and shallow shallow that's the best way to think about it Andrew they're shallow and this is the best I think some of the best people on the right and part of the shallowness comes from, uh, and part of the only seeing darkness comes from 
you know, this attitude of, well, I mean, the left is so horrible, then everything must be horrible. Everything is about the left. And by doing so, they don't introspect about the fact that they are to a large extent responsible. I mean, they are to a large extent responsible. Which is sad, which is sad. Because again, this is a major intellectual of the right, certainly one of the more well-spoken and, uh, and uh, published writers on the right. And all they can see is the darkness all they can see is 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 somehow you know uh, the, the all, all this bad stuff, and they have no solution for it, no solution for it. Because suddenly, I don't think even Al Ferguson thinks that Donald Trump is the solution. He, I mean, he is a supporter, but I don't think he sees that as a solution. But what is the solution? What are the values necessary to solve this problem? It's all the same old. They're conservatives, so. Uh, the solution is just just hearkening back to whenever they 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 think was best. Certainly not to the founding fathers. That would be hearkening back to principles, and we can't do that. So, uh, God, the Soviet Union. We we've got to that point where the right is comparing to the United States, the Soviet Union. I mean, I don't know. I, I just gave an incredibly pessimistic talk at Ocon, and I feel like. You know, I, I'm the optimist in the block because I don't think we're at the level of the Soviet Union for a lot of different reasons. And I think that over, over playing your hand in terms of the darkness, I mean, you know what this is. I, I get what this is. It's a Flight 93 type essay, right? Do you remember the Flight 93? I've talked about this many times. And I talked about it when it was pu actually published in 2016. Flight 93... Uh, at the time, it was written anonymously. I, right now, the name of the guy who wrote it slips my mind, but at the time, it was anonymous. And basically, Flight 93 is the flight, um, the, the fourth hijacked flight on 9-11, where the passengers made this calculation. Basically, they were dead, right? Because uh, they had realized by this point that the plan, uh, this plane was going to fly into the White House or something. It was going to, they were all going to die. So they stormed the cockpit with the idea that worst case scenario, they would die anyway. And best case scenario, they can take control of the plane. That's the attitude of Flight 93. Things are so bad in America, so bad in America, that we need to rush the cockpit. We're dead anyway. The Chinese are taking us over anyway. So we might as well rush the cockpit. And what does rushing the cockpit look like? What does rushing the cockpit look like um, in 2024? It looks like voting for Trump and using government to suppress the impact, the, 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 the horrific impact of the left. That's what it looks like. That's rushing the cockpit. We're probably going to die anyway. It's January 6th, yeah. It, we're, we're probably going to die anyway, but at least we have a shot somehow. And that's what this kind of thinking leads you to. Yeah, to hell with freedom. What we need is whatever, whatever it takes to get rid of the left because they're destroying this country without recognizing the fact that much of this country was destroyed by the right as well as the left. And that the solutions the right has, 136% tariffs, are just as bad as what the left is offering us. All right. On that wonderful note, yeah, it's nihilism of the left and nihilism of the right. The nihilism of the right is wrapped in this facade of we're just doing it to save the world. It's, it's desperation. And the times require it because the times are desperate. But it, the result actions same thing